Where are we doing you, that? You do, I, I, no, no, come on, you've got to do this as well. Right, sit on, up you straight. Do, you do sorted then, food, are you there? Breathe deep. Sorted food, are you there? Go. Sorted food! Are you there? Ben, you're a much better singer. Your throat's closed. You're like this. Are you there? <laughs> are you there? Getting better. I mean, you do sound like Kermit, but yeah, it is It is <laughs> getting <you> better. <laughs> Halfway up the stairs, there's a snare I sit. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Under the Cloche, the podcast where we don't lift the cloche on food, but people. And we try and find the most fascinating people from the most interesting walks of life and understand how food plays a part in that journey. And boys, I mean, I'm buzzing for today's guest. I can tell Ben, you're itchy. I I think this is going to be great. This this person I think is already going to be my new best friend. Absolutely (laughs) iconic, especially in the UK. Definitely. I, I think he's one of the most memorable advert tv advert characters that we've ever seen yeah but also the main fact is this guy is an opera singer yeah so boys the fact that we are in our own pub at the moment um what do you what do you think of the vibe so far well uh, when we were putting this together (laughs) and uh, ebba's first thought was is it a pub or is it a nan's living room these these sofas were sourced from a nan's living room. <laughs> I, can, I can guarantee and none that. of our nans. No. They are second-hand nan There's, if these are, furniture. Yeah. And we're calling it a pub, but obviously we need people in the pub playing the pub roles. We we need a landlord or landlady. We need... Is it a gastro pub? I mean, these are Foodie, all... Foodie, no. chefs. These we are need, We need bar people. We need the gardener. We need, we need the local propped up against the bar, don't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah there's yeah, always yeah. local... Yeah. Yeah. Who's, in the, who's in the booth in the corner? I feel like the vibe is very booth in the corner of the pub. Yeah. yeah. Staying out of everyone's way. Is <laughs> yeah. what you're saying? All, all I'm hoping is that the food that we serve here is slightly higher quality than a very traditional British pub. Well, I reckon every week we get a new guest under the cloche, we ask them for one of their favourite foodie moments of all time, and that just goes on the weekly special board. You're, you're willing to... You're going to cook like, them up their favourite food of all time? No. Each week? I'm, no, I'm going to write it on a chalkboard. <laughs> oh, right, <okay. laughs> And then Cushy's going to bring it out. Yeah. Love yeah, that, love yeah. that. So, yeah, I mean, Win Evans... What do you think? What what role would he play at our pub? Oh, he's got to okay. be front of front of house. He's right? got good. But it's pub pub quiz night. Surely he's the host of pub quiz night. Host the pub quiz. He could host the pub quiz yeah. or the karaoke. I mean, let's just. Yeah. But I also think you're missing a trick by not having him in the kitchen because yeah. he's he's won Celebrity Master Chef and he's clearly a phenomenal cook as well. Right. So, you two are the ones who are going to be interviewing. Mr. Go oh, Compare. Yeah. I'd say it's more of a chat. Okay, a chat, a casual chat. But please, there's a couple of questions that um, myself and Jamie need to leave oh. with you. Um, <sighs> the first one, <laughs> uh, Jamie's, actually, Jamie's is asking... Start um, the sensible one. Yeah, start the sensible one. Jamie wants to know, uh, are there any foods that help him with his singing voice or hinder him? Okay. Okay. You know? Yeah. Uh, mine is... So I've, see, I've seen this thing online that is possible to break a wine glass with your voice if yeah. you can match the same tone I've seen that an awful lot but frequency it's always, it's always in cartoons it's like Tom and Jerry isn't it it's like it's always in silly cartoons yes. what, so Looney you've Tunes. actually seen someone do it yeah, it, is, Mike, so it is possible Mike Boyd okay. did it on his, on his channel so I'm like Again, and you want wind to break yeah, a, a, a wine opera glass singer. live on a podcast. He can shatter that window. That is dangerous. <laughs> Our pub is full of glassware. Okay, you were, okay, right, yeah, yeah fine. Yeah, we'll yeah, ask yeah, him that, yeah, for nice. sure. We'll ask cool. him if he's up for it. <laughs> have you got a wine glass? <laughs> we'll find one. Of course he has. He could do an Asahi bottle. Yeah, oh, sorry, do you have an empty wine glass? Yes. Oh, plenty. Oh, <laughs> they're all empty. That's okay. <laughs> so our guest today is actor, opera singer... Celebrity MasterChef winner and iconic operatic insurance salesman, <laughs> Win Evans. Welcome to Under the Cloche. It's Hello. great to have you here. You've seen me in the ads. <laughs> Acting is a stretch, right? So maybe you shouldn't say that. The, one of the best caricatures of any like I opera think singer. It's one of the most iconic advertising people or characters we've ever had. So for our audience who aren't based in the UK, can you just explain a little bit about why we keep banging on about the Go Compare yeah. opera singer? As it, I like to explain it like this. It's like, I'm like a British version of George Clooney. Boom. 
<laughs> so no, I'm not. So I'm not right. you, you are to insurance comparison sites what George Clooney is to Nespresso. <laughs> I like that. I am. Uh, the Go Compare advert, people say it's annoying, it's effective. Um, it's an advert that's been running in the UK for 15 years with this fat, portly singer turns up in unexpected places and tells people the virtue of comparing their car insurance to get cheaper prices. And I've had a lot of people ask me for quotes when I'm out. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A woman in a field once As asked if me. you're like, yeah, Let sure. me just check. Let me just check yeah. for you. Well, she no claims. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, she said to me like this, right? She goes, oh, hello. I'm glad I've seen you. I was actually working at the time for the BBC, right? I, I was with the camera crew. <laughs> and I said, oh, can you just give me a minute, uh, love? And she goes, no, no. Uh, can I just ask you a quick question? I was like, just give me a moment. Uh, so I'm doing this. Welcome to Slangothlin, the sights and sounds of the international... Excuse, excuse me, can we just have a quick word with you? <laughs> she goes. I go, oh, all right. So, and I go, what do you want? And she goes, no, <clears throat> my daughter's just turned 17. <laughs> We're thinking about buying her a little Clio and we wondered what the insurance would be, right? So I go, you are... <laughs> I said, you know, I don't sell insurance. I'm just an opera singer in an insurance advert, don't you? And so she goes, and then she wouldn't shut up, right? She kept going and going and going. I thought there's only one way to get rid of this woman, right? And I remember it to this day, like an outer body experience, when I turned to her and I said, what's your postcode? Right? <laughs> so she tells me a postcode. And then I say to her, like a dick, right? Like an absolute fool, I go... Are you keeping the car on the drive or the motorway, right? <laughs> Classic <laughs> question. Classic. And she tells me... And Is she, it for business or leisure? Yeah, it was that kind of thing. How many miles did you do it a year? Um, I thought, I've got to make it sound official. And so I thought, well, look, she's just 17, just passed her test. So I go like it. It's going to be about £3,000. I'm in the middle of a field. It's going to be about £3,000. And she turned to me, she goes, well, that's a rip-off. It's only 2400 with direct line. <laughs> She just left me there in the field. She walked, she stormed away. So yeah, that's what, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> so we eat all day, every day, but yeah. what's the one time that you can remember of being just that moment that was just so special? What was it and why was it so special? Because it's going on our specials board. Okay, well, I had, I had this bizarre experience, right? So I'm out in Lyon, because I was working at the Opera House in Lyon, right? Mm -hmm. In France. And Paul Bocuse is from Lyon, right? Who basically created Michelin, right? Yeah. yeah. So he's got this place out there called Les Alpes Paul Bocuse, which is like a, where producers go and they just, the very best of the French produce goes there. And you can have like a drink from there, an oyster from there, some saucy so on from there. You can have bread from over there. You can just do whatever you want. Anyway, so I'm there, right? And I've got a bit of everything. And I've had a couple and uh, I'm with a guy who was playing rugby for Leon at the time, another Welsh guy called Hugh Bennett. This girl goes, do you mind if I join you, right? So I'm going, yeah, yeah, pull up a chair. She goes, I just heard you talking English. I'm feeling a bit homesick. She was American, right? Feeling a bit homesick. So we're there and we have, we've got, we've literally got some oysters and some saucy saw and some bread. I love those little bits, mm. those little yeah. nibbles that you have, right? So, so I was talking to her, we were talking to her. I said, oh, what do you do for a living? She goes, oh, I play a bit of football. Well, it turns out that this footballer was Megan Rapino, <laughs> right? Who has got like gazillions of followers on the internet. It is an absolute icon yeah, in America. World Cup winner. World Cup winner, Olympic gold medalist, Champions League winner, you know, <laughs> everything. Turn down tea with Trump. You know, she is <laughs> yeah, a, yeah. a proper icon. So that would probably be my food gasm, I guess, you know, just eating little nibbles like that in really relaxed surroundings drinking loads of really cold white wine superb i feel like you must have you must have traveled in your so your, your early life as an opera singer like, where are the best places that have like opened up amazing food experiences when you've been there i suppose spain is really good uh you know because you do get loads of fresh fish the, i love the tapas I love, like i said i love the little dish uh, just a just a quick note to people watching or listening if you're going on a date right because i got divorced when I was like 45, so I was back on the dating scene at mm -hmm. 45, right? Don't go for tapas on a date, right? Because nobody wants to eat anything. This is yeah. what I've realized later on. Well, no one on. wants the last mouthful of anything, so Nothing, you're left right? with some of everything. And you're drinking like it's going out of fashion. Yeah. So the next thing, you're totally off your face and there's like bits of food Still left of on food the tip left. that you're scared to eat. Yeah. So yeah, I love America. I love everything about American. 
uh, food. I love burgers. I love a dirty burger. Yeah. You know, if you if it's a top quality one. Are you a, a double patty or a single patty? Oh, double every time. Yeah, Whatever absolutely. the biggest is. Smash burger. <laughs> I could do three. Yeah. Four. A triple patty. I was huh? twenty. Um, a year ago, I was twenty three stone. I've lost seven stone in the last year, so I've had to kind of give up the bread and the burgers and the cheese. Mm-hmm. I love cheese. And what was it that that was the weight loss driver? Like, was there one particular thing or? I think. Oh my God. This is so embarrassing, right? And I've never told anybody this, right? So I hope it doesn't kind of do that thing, right? I went camping and I sat on a chair. (laughs) And it just smashed underneath me. So I thought, I'll sit on that chair instead. And that smashed as well. And I thought, this has to come to an end because I'm smashing chairs left and center. Why can I imagine that that was actually just the next advert? I feel like that is in character, like (laughs) camping equipment. Have you got it insured? Like that is literally, that's it. It should have been. It should have been. Uh, yeah, so that was the moment. And I, I just started walking a lot. I cut out the cheese. Under yes. 2,000 calories a day. Drinking a bit less. Uh, Saving the drink for the special occasions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And trying to get everything under control, really. Because so I, I could eat a cheese sandwich while I'm cooking. Yeah, yeah. And so are you cooking a lot at home? Like, are you, yeah. are you at home enough? Uh, to be regularly cooking or are you cooking for sort of mates or friends, family? I suppose that's the problem, Nick. You're away a lot. You yeah. don't do these big shops, so you just do little shops. Yeah. It's a pain. But I cook a lot at home. Yeah. And my son cooks a lot. Oh, great. Yeah, and my so daughter cooks as well. Yeah, he's really... In, like, he introduced me to stuff like... Because it was like just pre-lockdown and stuff, so he's watching a lot of YouTube, watching a lot of socials. So he's finding all these chefs that I... Like no, but don't really know. Yeah, and he's going. He comes up to me. I think he's about thirty, and he goes, "Dad, we really must get a sous vide machine now." <laughs> I was like, oh, "Good what? lad, <laughs> oh, what a sous vide machine!" I said, "I've absolutely no idea what that is, mate." And so yeah, so he's taught me a lot, actually. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, how did do? You, is that just something that came naturally? Because as a family, you have got that passion, interest of food, or is that something you actually went out to? I'm going to get my kids into cooking and cooking early and understanding that as a skill because I mean you had that growing up but I think Mm. our kind of generation we weren't really taught at school unless we were taught by our parents we sort of came across food and and the skill of learning to cook when you when it became a necessity it's like I'm at uni or I'm on my own I've got to learn Mm. and figure this thing out um so with your kids is it something that you sort of specifically thought I'm going to yeah. get them into that. I'm going to teach them. My mother was petrified that we were going to become butch rugby players. <laughs> so she sent me for cookery lessons and ballroom dancing from about the age of seven. So every week we'd go to cookery outside of school. Uh, every week we'd go dancing. And so it was like, it was just a really natural thing. When we were in college, my brother and myself, because we both were opera singers and we both had the same kind of upbringing, like everybody would come around to us for food because we lived above the old Spitalfields market. Oh, wow. So every day you had this abundance of fruit and veg and you could get it like for free. Going yeah. there, says, oh, I live upstairs, can I get some fruit and veg? Yeah, yeah, just have what's left. And then you'd make, I mean, we made some absolutely absolute minging stuff <laughs> and some good stuff that, can, can I give you my mother's recipe for spaghetti bolognese yeah <laughs> so this is going now back to the 70s right in Carmarthen in deepest darkest west Wales right you might, might want to write this down because it's quite complicated but we'll watch this back okay um, one tin of Campbell's tomato soup gotcha one tin of corned beef there we go <laughs> <laughs> I mean that is Italian through and through yeah. <laughs> add spaghetti and that I don't know maybe you're too young to remember right but we used to have parmesan in a pot that smelled like, like sick Smell like, oh yeah vomit yeah. 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 so we'd have that on the top as well <laughs> that's with corned beef and Campbell's soup oh my soup, goodness I haven't like, thought about that and I've just been taken back to being seven years yeah, old yeah. And that, that cheese dust the, yeah the cheese dust and it did smell like vomit Oh my and goodness. it lived in the dry store, never went anywhere near a fridge. No, no God, no. <laughs> Don't leave it near the fridge. No. It'll go off. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that was my mother. But she was quite good cooking other things. She was, she was Belgian, my mother was. So she could do the tomate crevette, which is like prawns and tomatoes and sorts of potatoes. But she used to think that Italian food was just for, you know, other people. So when we'd have spaghetti volunteers, that was it. That was, that oh, was, was the classic. Was disgusting. So we had a lot of corned beef, a lot of liver 
a lot of the stuff that you wouldn't kind of probably eat. And yeah, that probably is the big stereotype. When you think of opera singer, you probably think of big bowls of spaghetti and meatballs, pizza, <sighs> lots of Italian classics. Yeah. Like that is a stereotypical image. Yeah. And that is also kind of the role in the character you played for yeah, many, yeah, or still played for yeah. many, many years. Yeah. Has food ever been a part of that kind of conversation? Look, totally. Um, when I came back from my first day in school, my mother said to me, what was school like? I said, school was awful, but the restaurant's good, right? <laughs> okay. I just loved the lunch. I loved, I live to eat. I don't eat to live. I yeah. absolutely adore food. I love everything about it. I love going to markets and seeing the fresh produce and all of this. I went to Puglia a few years ago on my holidays where they make the uh, orecchietti, which is the pasta that's like made with your thumb. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, you have that and burrata, which is, you know, basically mozzarella injected with double cream. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, these are the things I absolutely love. Lovely olive oil, you know, lovely things like that. So, but pasta, yeah, I mean... If I had to take one cuisine on a desert island with me, it would be Italian. Yeah. Because I think they've got everything. They've nailed it. And it's so, like, it, it is so simple. It's so just simple. knowing how to com combine the simple ingredients. Good ingredients. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like fresh, my grandmother used, was Belgian. My great-grandmother was Belgian. And they were quite well off. And she used to call it peasant's food. Because it's so simple. Mm. You know, you think of pasta, it's just flour and eggs, right? Yeah. That's it. And so wonderfully regional. Like yeah, you, yeah. you move from one town to another and the, the, the dishes and the kind of recipes change and they're passed down through generation. Do you, do you find that in, in Wales that there are kind of like lost recipes? Recipes that haven't necessarily travelled nearly as much as the Italian cuisine has the world over. Yeah. I feel like Welsh is a cuisine that not so many people know beyond maybe lamb and Welsh cakes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot more. There's, like you were saying about... Um, pasta you know uh, and regionality lamb changes so much mm. if you have there's Brecon lamb which is delicious comes from the uh, venison farm bizarrely in Brecon they, they keep sheep as well that is beautiful lamb and uh, it's very very tender very very mild tasting lamb then you go to the salt marsh where they eat a lot of samphire yeah. the sheep do and stuff and you get that saltiness in the Season lamb. Seasoned through. So it's properly seasoned. So they're two totally different brilliant products. But there's loads of recipes you know cockles, mm. mussels. It was a huge coastline. Yeah massive mussels, fish, lobster, crabs, oysters now is a massive thing that's that's farmed and native oysters down there. So you've got the native oysters in North Wales on the Menai Straits and then you've mm -hmm. got farmed oysters in Pembrokeshire and lava bread that's probably one of the lost ones and you think how mad we go for nori right yeah. and sushi and stuff like this yeah we don't eat lava bread so nutritious so affordable but it's one of those things I think people are sometimes scared by it or confused by it because lava what, yeah what exactly is it for people who don't know it's seaweed washed through and through and through and boiled up that is it right but it looks like a baby's first poo yeah. That's what it looks oh, like. Yeah. It, it looks sometimes has some oats in it as well to mind it. Was it just seaweed? You know, it's that's, almost paste lava bread is just it? the seaweed, right? And then you can add to it. So you can fry it up with cockles, you can add flour to it and oats and make it into little cakes. Uh, on MasterChef, I made um, I use it a lot on MasterChef because it's really it's just another way of putting salt into your food. Mm. It's really good. Yeah. And it's a different kind of salt. And so, it has that umami, it's the natural umami. Oh, it's just amazing. I made these pom dauphines, right? Which, if you ever want, so so I've had this. Oh, here we go. Huh? So I don't want to interrupt you. Well, you, you did interrupt. I know. I'm sorry, but you were you were talking about Welsh cakes. Oh my so word! So I thought we might bring in some Welsh cakes for you. Now, some were made by our podcast producer Fion. Yeah. Some were made by a chef. Yeah. One I'll of them's up, Welsh. I'll leave it up to you to decide. Yeah. <laughs> Whether, I think yeah. I think Fion should invest in uh, in a cutter for the house, shouldn't she? <laughs> <laughs> Instead of just doing it with uh, whatever she can find. A shot glass. Yeah. Uh, so if you, if you fancy, yeah, yeah. Fancy the Welsh cake, feel free. Oh yeah, I will take. Can I take one of each and do a oh, taster? Oh, nice. Yes. Nice. And then we also have some uh, bar snacks. <laughs> Jake. Oh, great. Bar, great. Can't wait for that. Crisp. Don't, don't look at me like this. Ben, open them. <laughs> well, crisp. <laughs> Classic bar. Have, have, have a Welsh cake. Oh, right. Take a Welsh cake. You, you made these, didn't you? Like, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, again, it's one of those things that is so, so simple. It's pretty much three, four ingredients with mm. an egg, a few currants, and on the griddle, and yet they taste so, so good, especially when they're still warm. These ones aren't warm. Fians are good. 
Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're, they're, they're like, they're quite moist in the middle. A little That's bit of the spice danger. in them as well. Yeah, a little bit of cinnamon in yeah. those. Be honest. you got a bit of crunch on yours. Do you cook them on a stone? On a, on a yeah, cast iron griddle. Mm. So not a stone stone, but... No, because the Welsh one is cast iron. Oh, is it? Mm. The Welsh one should be cast iron, yeah. But what's your favourite? I'm going to have to go with yours, I'm afraid. Oh, thank, thank, you, thank you. I mean, I like Fionn's. <laughs> I do like Fionn's. They are nice, but... Uh, More homely. So, and how, how often? I kind of feel like... I mean, I mean we don't I've just sit there eating Welsh cakes all day. No. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what you're going to ask. No, that was my, that was my next question. You stereotype. Yeah. Sorry. It's, we it's, bounce from cockles to lava bread to Welsh cakes, but yeah. like, how often is the Welsh produce like celebrated day in and day Not out? Not enough. Not, Not enough. We don't shout about it enough, you know? Mm. I made this commitment when I went on MasterChef to only use Welsh produce, which I actually went to, which I did by accident. Because the first couple of dishes, I thought I'll do what I know. So I did a rack of lamb, Welsh lamb. Then I did faggots, right? Do you know what faggots are? Yeah. yeah. It's basically like heart, liver. Yeah, just awful, awful and cool fat. Yeah. Just awful, right? And uh, that was the one we had to uh, serve to past winners. And I went out and, and then I thought, what a d- Why have I made? <laughs> like something that famously turns people's stomach, yeah. Yeah. heart and liver. Why have I made this for a taste in? So I got Vicky Patterson, Rylan and Andy Peters there. <laughs> what a, what and, a and, and I go, here we go, here's a faggot. And they go, oh, what's a faggot? And I said, it's like a Welsh meatball. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's as specific as I went. Yeah. Sausage, yeah. It cost like 10 pence to make, you know. How did it go down? They loved it. Then I told them what was in it. So yeah, so that was that. But the best thing I did with lava bread, now if you've never made these at home, right, you have to do it. You'll know exactly what they are, right? Pom Dauphine. Yeah. Oh my God, that is like, get a defibrillator in the house first, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, Because they are like, I want, this is my dream, right, to open a restaurant called the Angina Diner, right? <laughs> Who thought to mix mashed potato with shoe pastry? Oh. It's like genius. a profiterole. It is genius. And you deep fat fry it, right? So good. And then I injected lava bread into the middle with creme fraiche. Just a couple of extra calories. And so <laughs> when you bite into it, you get this burst of saltiness. It's just like, yeah. oh, so delicious. And yet yeah, you're so right that seaweed is popular as a superfood yeah. from Japan. And it's yeah. something, you know, we absolutely love sort of mm. Japanese nori and all the different seaweeds that we can get out there. But it's not something we celebrate enough of. No, here. not at all. Not at all. Can I ask anything about oh, fantastic? <laughs> so, going back to your operatic background, mm-hmm. how did you get into that? And then, I'm so sorry to keep bringing this up, but how on earth did that move you into the Go Compare yeah, yeah. opportunity and how that turned into what it did? So, my mother and father, my mother was a hairdresser, my father was a, a builder, right? But they also were involved in youth opera, amateur dramatics. Yeah. My mother decided that the town needed a theatre. And so she kind of squatted in this theatre until the council said, all right, you can have you can this theatre, right? So she had the theatre. So we were, I was about, I don't know, I was about 10 or 12 at the time. But they needed this film, right? So this has been made into a movie by Sky, right? This has. Uh, they needed a film to kind of launch it. And so my mum chose Jurassic Park, right? I don't know if you know this story. Yeah. Uh, so, but the film distributor said the day before, the, or a couple of days before, that there wasn't enough copies to go around. So my mother went to see the mayor of Carmarthen. Now Carmarthen is a small market town in West Wales with about fifteen thousand people. The mayor was the local postman, <laughs> right? But he was his turn to be the mayor, right? <laughs> <laughs> so my mother goes to see him, and he goes, "I guess, ah, oh, this is terrible, Liz. Especially, you know, you have to your save in this theatre and all of this." Uh, he said. What we'll have to do is we'll have to ring Steven Spielberg, right? So my brother goes, oh, that's a brilliant idea. We've got to ring him. So they ring Spielberg's Simple office, enough. right? Yeah. Uh, and of course, the main America is massive, right? It's like a really important job. So this guy goes on the phone. He goes, oh, yeah, it's the mayor of Camarthen in Wales, yeah? <laughs> Which quickly became the mayor of Wales, right? <laughs> Next thing, my mother's on the phone to Spielberg, right? No. And she's telling him the story about the, this theatre that she saved and this youth opera and how it's got kids. Because the whole youth opera was made up of kids from underprivileged backgrounds. 
And so she's telling him this story, and he says, oh, God, I'll send you my copy of the film, Stas Spielberg, right? So he sent got his... got a director's cut. <laughs> well, not quite, mate, not quite, but not far off. And he says, and I tell you what, instead of the premiere in London, you can have it in Carmarthen. <gasps> right? So the premiere of Jurassic Park was in Carmarthen in West Wales. That actually Wales. happened. That actually happened. So that's kind of how I got into theatre, because I was around theatre all the time. Uh, then I went to the Guildhall School of Music, mm. studied there, was principal at uh, Scottish Opera, Welsh National Opera, Royal Opera House. And my mate rang me up, and I'd done this other advert, right, for, um, hang on, yep. crisps, <laughs> right? Walker's crisps. That was Gary Lineker's voice. And he was pushing the late Tara Palmer Tompkinson on a swing. So I had to go, where is my love? I am here, my love. I have brought crisps for you. Right? And it was like this. It was meant to be like a smooth opera. Anyway, my mate wrote the music for it. And then he'd written the music for this other advert. And he said, oh, you've got to come and do this advert. I said, oh, I don't really want to do it. So I rock up at the advert. Eventually, they agreed to pay me to go to the edition. Right? <laughs> so I went to the edition. Um, what I didn't realise is, is that the company that I was auditioning for, which turned out to be Go Compare, was a Welsh company, and it was owned by a Welsh lady. She devised it. And she had said, look, if you can have the same guy in the advert that is singing, that would be brilliant. If he was a, a little bit fat, that would be incredible, because she'd always struggled with her weight a bit. And she said, and one last thing, she said, I mean, if he was Welsh, that would be like off the scale. Right, so they said because these people that were making the ad was a couple called Chris and Sean Wilkins, advertising royalty. Right, mm. you're t too young to remember, but they did the Mash Get Smash Aliens in the seventies, all the Hamlet adverts through the eighties. We're talking Sheila's Wheels, <laughs> uh, yeah. Michael Winner. It's already a commercial. You know, they did all of those adverts, and uh, I rock up and they're kind of going, "Who's this guy?" So I kind of go. Over there, because it was a song called Over There, right? Yeah. Uh, that they changed to Go Compare. So I start singing, and, and they go, right, can you do a Welsh accent? So I kind of went, Go Compare, and all of that. And they went, oh, what about Italian? So like, I'm kind of going, Go Compare, Go Compare, when you in short. And they went, this is it, this is it, right? So it's like, <laughs> this is so good. This is so good. <laughs> and that's how I got the job. I mean, how quickly did it sort of escalate from there? I remember it came out on... August the 18th, 2009, right? And I uh, went for dinner the night before with the writers and they said, we'd made five of these adverts, right? In, we'd shot five in a week. And the first one that came out was called Coffee Shop. Yeah, that's where I that slid that across, iconic right? One, yeah. And the guy goes, oh, it's only a tenner, right? right? I think your life's going to change tomorrow, they said. And I was like, I don't think so. It's an advert. Like I'd done the crisp advert. I knew that yep. you don't really get recognize or anything you know it came out and there was three things about this ad that kind of were different it had a massive tv spend huge it had that jingle which was really mm, catchy familiar, yeah. yeah and it was the first massive advert i suppose within the age of social networking mm. so people could instantly tell you what they thought of it mm, yeah and god <laughs> yeah for good so and for bad <laughs> I remember, right, I, just afterwards, I went on all day to France, and uh, actually, I bu booked this villa. I don't know why I booked it. It was next door to a slaughterhouse, but that was another story. <laughs> uh, my mate uh, messages me, and he goes, oh, I've seen your ad on the telly. What a shame uh, there's more hate members than people are like, like you. So I had a look. I hate when Evans the Go Compare Man, right? It was on Facebook. And there was quite a few members. <laughs> so I thought, oh, what I'll do is, right, I'll look up somebody that I really don't like and I'll see how many people dislike them. It'll give me a gauge on how hated I am, <laughs> yeah. right? So I thought about Nick Griffin, right? Remember, he used to run the British National Party, right? Yeah. Oh Not a nice bloke, God. right? Not a nice bloke. So I tell you, 75,000 people were a member of I Hate Nick Griffin on Facebook. <laughs> I hate when Evans the Go Compare Man, 2.75 million, <laughs> right? So I was like, oh my the God, most hated. I am so hated. I was voted the most hated man in Britain for three years, right? <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, it took so much getting used to. But it, that is remarkable because it's so deliberately tongue in cheek and not serious. It's yeah. not like it, you were taking yourself or the role seriously. I, and yet people still thought it was yeah. real. That's social media, that is social media. I thought people yeah. would just go, oh, 
this is funny. Yeah. It's a fat guy in a suit. Yeah. You know, that was it. So, yeah, so that was pretty did, grim. Yeah. I, I mean, how did you how did you deal with that? I didn't because handle not, it brilliantly at first, no, I've got to be honest. Because it's, it's tough. I mean, it, from what we do as well, you are putting yourself out there and there are keyboard warriors. There yeah, are yeah. people who just, they just don't think, they type. Yeah. And you have to almost go through this sort of process of, being able to read or not read and shut it out and retain some sort of logic and, and context. But how how did you find that and how did you deal with it moving forward? I think it's very hard at the start once you've been called whatever yeah. once though. By the time you get to the 700th time that day, you're like, oh well. It takes a long time getting used to. People forget like you guys, me, we're here today filming this because we're just like making a living. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to pay the mortgage. We want to feed the yeah. kids. That's about, that's it. And you carried on performing professionally yeah, op- yeah, opera did, throughout yeah. all of yeah. this. So yeah, you'd still lot. get all of that applause and, and yeah. standing ovation in that world. Yeah, it was just the hate a, that you get when you put the moustache on. Yeah, it was, te- it was grim. And then I thought, I don't care. And uh, I just got on with it. Lean and into it. Yeah, it really It's quite liberating. It. And I, like, the, the fact that you're it's it's really nice to be able to chat to you about it because you, for us on the on the interim like you said we're that we're that generation who are like that's iconic like this is so cool <laughs> and there are a lot of people who who probably have some sort of cultural significance in a way uh, similarly that are like right well, uh, uh, you know that, that's not what I really do like that's not my my thing and don't really lean into it but you seem really re- willing to talk about yeah. it and celebrate it and look it made it. me it made me right yeah. I wouldn't be here talking to you I wouldn't have done MasterChef I wouldn't have my own show on Radio Wales I wouldn't be doing Radio 2 I wouldn't be doing any of that without the Go Compare advert so I think why would I I once mm. interviewed Kiki D right <laughs> right and she didn't want to talk about Don't Go Breaking My Heart. Yeah, I was like, that's it. Well, why? <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't you want to? Yeah. And it was interesting, actually, what people like turn their back on those things. I think I get it all the time. You know, people singing at me. Across now, the street. Uh, just across yeah. Constantly. In the toilet. And you think, is this appropriate? <laughs> <laughs> is it appropriate? Somebody wants to What are they ask asking you? you to compare? I know, it's like, <laughs> this is going to be very embarrassing for you, sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, somebody once asked me for a selfie. I'll never forget it, right? I was at my grandmother's funeral. And somebody's going, oh, can I have a selfie? And I remember them taking the selfie and you could see the coffin in the background. <laughs> Where's the line? Because yeah, apparently there not no there. Line. There is no line. I don't mind it at all. Honestly, I, I kind of celebrate it. I love it. I, I think it's just part of me and it's, you know. I mean, it, it, it's what is fascinating, certainly for me, is, you know, you've trained and become elite in something in as an opera singer. Yeah. And then that's afforded you a, another opportunity into a complete curveball and taking you in somewhere that you'd never dreamed of, that's blown up. But then also there's another evolution to the story as well in terms of the other media opportunities you'd be able to do with the the radio shows, but also Mm -hmm. then leading to something like Celebrity MasterChef. Like, how did that come about? And yeah, like how... I'm fascinated into how they actually go about filming that and whether you're serving food cold, are you waiting in a separate room with the judges? How does it work? Firstly, the judges are really distant. You don't see them at all, yeah. unless you're in the kitchen. They're very, very professional like that. I mean, I know them both now, separately. Yeah. And you literally, the first time you walk into that kitchen is... Is it? You see it on camera. Yeah. That is it. You're not allowed to wear a watch. You're not allowed to take your phone in. So it's like a Vegas casino. It is. No, no daylight. No, I hadn't thought about that. It is like that. I wonder if they're pumping oxygen in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm like this heady, headiness that you go in with. Just bring you drinks. It's just like bizarre. And then you think, right, what am I going to cook? Mm. I wouldn't say it was cold food, but there is a long wait. An hour. Yeah. It's, I mean, I mean, we, we obviously do a lot of that as well, which we, we are getting sexy shots, pack shots. So yeah. the camera and the people at yeah, home yeah. get the best of it. The judges get second best because yeah. everyone at home is kind of more important, actually, than, than the judge yeah, in that process. Yeah, you TV programme. How did, how did you handle the pressure? Because, or did you feel the pressure? Yeah. I mean, you've performed on stage in front of thousands of people. Though. but it's, it's funny because I had a bit of a, 
not a breakdown, but I had some serious mental health issues in 2016 when my marriage broke down. And uh, I remember I couldn't face anything in life. And the only place I felt safe was on stage mm. because it's what I was trained to do. Mm. And you kind of go into this autopilot. I don't know if you feel that when you're in the kitchen, right? But well, you that, do. Yeah. Uh, and you kind of feel safe. It's your safe space. MasterChef was different though because I'm not tr trained to be a cook mm. and you're trying to do something you haven't really haven't got a clue and they'll say of course you're going to do blah 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 and you go yeah were, were you able to take very familiar ingredients as well in terms yeah, of well, I, would you would you do that because obviously with Welsh produce yeah. you kind of were very familiar with what you were working with did they source that or would you sort of take the food that they you would wanted source to some of it but some of it they couldn't source lava bread was a particular problem for them we have another thing called Barabreath, which is like a tea cake. So I had to get special permission in order to be able to soak my fruit in tea overnight. Otherwise, you can't really make it very mm -hmm. well. So, um, yeah. And, and then I called upon mates. Well, I'm my own pig, see? So, oh, right. Yeah. You, I, you, so, keep, you keep animals? Well, I only keep a couple like pigs. Uh, and then when the pigs aren't there, the lambs are in. My favourite headline, actually, because there's a few of us that own these pigs and we share a field. We kind of came up with this in the pub in Where West Where all Wales. the best ideas yeah. happen. So I don't really do much with the pigs, right? That's a guy called Irish Paul. Now you'll say, <laughs> what's his surname? I have no idea what his surname <laughs> is, right? So Irish Paul gets the pigs, Irish Paul gets the lamb, and then he kind of looks after them and we send them to slaughter. I remember being in this, I remember being in this field with this pig, right, that I knew I was going to take on MasterChef. And I called it salt, right after uh, pepper pig, you know, so salt. <laughs> and uh, this salt and pepper. This pig, right? This pig. We're trying to get this pig into the truck to take it to the abattoir, right? It knows. It knows, right? Oh, it's like it's like no. I'm not falling for this one, mate. <laughs> and I I push it, right? I push it, push the the gate against this pig, and the pig goes out. But as I do that, the gate comes off the hinges, <laughs> right? And the pig goes, oh hello. Right, there's a chance. Turns round, just tramples me, and I my legs are stuck in manure, so I just fall backwards, right, like a statue, and the pig just runs over me like trotters <laughs> in the face and everything like it. <clears throat> I have to be power washed down in the back of the pub because right, I'm just full of manure. I'm thinking I'll kill that pig myself. Yeah. If I'm married, really, right? And my mate's going, don't, don't. We need it stamped from the abattoir so you can take it. So then I send it to this lady. Uh, called Ruth, who runs something called Kum Farm Charcuterie. And we make salami, parma ham, just like the best, mm. honestly. Mm. And there's a few of us doing it. Ken Owens, who was the captain of Wales rugby player, he makes his own biltong. Dan Lydiard wow. keeps black beef. And so I was using all these things on MasterChef. Mm. Alan Wynne Jones, who you know, was captain of the Lions, he makes his own rum. Catherine Jenkins makes her own gin. So I was taking all this stuff on MasterChef and trying to use as much of it as I could. It's so important to know where the food and the ingredients come from and if there's personal connections and people behind it. You've got celebrity backers Rather as well. than just a geography. It, but that's so important. Yeah, yeah. No, I, absolutely. I, I, it's made me more aware. And actually lockdown made me more aware mm. of local stuff. Mm. Because my radio show was at, it's at 9 o'clock now, but it was at 11 then. I could get up because I, I didn't have to go into the office for a meeting I could do a quick meeting on Zoom then I'd go down the village and buy and the farmers markets were yeah. still able to run because they were outside exactly and buy proper veg proper fruit proper meat where you know cheese mm. Mm. where you know where it comes from I know it's boring to say shop locally and it's it's way more expensive sometimes but um, sometimes but it's not but the quality difference is yeah. unreal because everyone goes oysters oh god they're so expensive they're about 70 pence each if you go down the fishmongers and buy them Carefully yeah. cheese, that's a bit special. I've got a problem with Carefully cheese, right? Great. I did use it on MasterChef, and somebody will prove me wrong in this, right? But Carefully Council, in their wisdom, decided to take the license away from, I think it was Carefully Council, uh, from the last, they used to make it in the back of a pub, but with all the food hygiene rates mm -hmm. and stuff, then it was, so Carefully cheese is now made in Somerset. Is it? Yeah. I had no oh, idea. Wow. Yeah. So... One of my plans is to bring it back to Wales. That would be very cool. Yeah, be really cool. Get start a petition. Like that's a that is a campaign, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like, bring it home. Yeah. Bring it home. One of the things we do on also do on the podcast is uh, ask a couple of questions from the other two guys who who aren't here, mm. uh, Jamie and Baz. Baz was asking, is it possible to 
shatter glass with your voice? I suppose it's possible if you hit the same resonator as the as the glass is resonating at. I don't know. I've never seen it though. Sorry, but you've never been tempted to try. Oh God, I've tried. <laughs> yeah, we never had a couple. You know, you go. Let's see if we can shatter this glass. Screaming your head off. I remember my mate doing it. He was Norwegian, and I'm going to do a terrible Norwegian accent. <laughs> and he was screaming, 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 trying to do this thing. And then he turned to me and he went, "I taste blood." <laughs> <laughs> he burst some kind of blood vessel in his neck, and he's like, "Oh God." <laughs> Which segues nicely onto Jamie's question, yeah. which was, are there any foods that you eat or drink uh, to protect your voice or vice versa, things you avoid in order to protect your voice? Yeah, they say uh, pineapple is really good for, because the first thing, opera, so opera, right, unmite. Mm. So you're singing like to maybe 3,000 people mm. at the Alba Hall or 5,000 at the Alba Hall rather, and it's totally unmiked, right? So you have to use all these resonators in your face. So your your main enemy is phlegm, right? Because <laughs> yeah. if that gets in there, everything's blocked up. They say pineapple is quite good for, it's quite acidic, so that breaks down the phlegm. They say, I've never gone with these, right? Because I always took the decision early on, I'm in charge of my voice, not the other way around, right? Yeah. Avoid dairy. Mm -hmm. The one thing I do avoid is alcohol if I'm singing. Because you know what it's like when you wake up after you've had a glass of red wine? You've got a frog in your throat. Yeah, and you think it's just because you've got a bit of a hangover. But actually, it's like the tannin in red wine mm -hmm. is awful for your voice. Really bad. It dries you out really bad. And you've just got to keep your vocal cords hydrated. So that, there's only one food I hate anyway, so... What's that? Oh, my God. Celery. C yeah. Celery is an anti-food. It's pointless. It's pointless oh, because dear. it's disgusting. And I thought this guy was a Master Chef winner. All yeah. chefs love celery. Yeah, oh, they put it in stock. <laughs> oh, I can yeah. taste it in the stock. And I'm like, why have you put that in there? It's yeah. crap, right? Also, like if you're eating it, I'm so weird. If you're eating it as it is, you've got to put like hummus, or you've got, you've got to put cover it in other yeah. flavour. Cover it in flavour and fat. Flavor. I just put your finger into the hummus. That's what I do. <laughs> I just take my just. Yeah, I it, don't need the celery as the vehicle. I've got my hands. It's got fibre. Yeah, it's like it's. It yeah, that gets stuck in your teeth good. for later. It's got weird little string in it. I'm so with you. Yeah, I like seeing it in a Bloody Mary, right? But only to stir. To take but it out. I, don't, I don't want it in there. No. Show it the glass and clear off. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> I like that. But and yet, it's classic dishes like cool, like. Welsh cool. Does that not have celery as like a oh, cow base? Uh, oh, no, cow. cow, no, no. Oh, there we go. It's the easiest dish in the world. There, my mother used to do it. Like when it was, you go. I think it might be snowing. I'll make a pot of cow, and she would make it in a five kind of gallon container with a tin of Campbell's and a tin of, <laughs> <laughs> tin of can, Yeah, it's so easy. It's potatoes, carrots, leeks, sweet. Controversial. Some people parsnip. Some people not. And you get a joint of lamb, and you literally put the, it all in with water. And That's it. it. Leave it for two hours. Yeah. Come back later. It tastes so good. I mean, how can it not? When you actually hear. Oh, if you add to anyone that, who's got the sniffles, that's yeah. like medicine right there. And put in the bowl. I know this is kind of my angina diner coming back again. But <laughs> put in the bowl like a little knob of butter, just to kind of cream it up, and mm. have it with bread and kefili cheese, and landed. See, we put butter on Welsh cake sometimes. And people Welsh butter's great. Salty. Yeah. It's really salty. Yeah. Hallin Morn. Do you know this mm -hmm. salt? This is salt. Right? They, they did it by accident. They were, they were trying to purify water to sell bottled water, and we left with the salt. And now it's become one of the biggest exports. It's like teen ant water. I mean, you yeah. know, the, the blue and the red bottles, right? Yeah. They're iconic. Some brands really have done it. I've got to give a shout out as well for some of the beers. Verlin Vol was the first beer in Europe to go into a, into a tin. Is that so, true? Yeah, and it's still going now. It's only a little family brewery. And then the Brains Brewery do something called SA, which is special ale, but we call it Skull Attack because you know you've been drinking it the next day. <laughs> do, you have, do you have a dirty uh, meal at the end of a session? We've got a place in Cardiff called Chippy Alley. Mm -hmm. And it's like all the chip shops in one alley and you just go down there and it's like... You just fill your boots. Oh, curry and chips. That sounds a bit like curry cheese, chi cheesy chips with curry sauce or crazy. I can't do the cheese and the curry. You can't? No. No, Curry chips half and half, half rice, half chips. Yeah. Yeah. Don't mix it. I wasn't going to bring this up, Win. Yeah. But a friend of mine has a friend... You see me in there, is he? Who was, no, in <laughs> oh. a uh, Pinchos restaurant in Cardiff 
not too long ago and apparently you just broke out into song is that is that, a, is that standard practice is that, is that just the energy that you bring to a room in a restaurant in cardiff is it a pinch a pinchos restaurant it's possible it's possible <laughs> It's possible. I remember being asked to leave a place in Cardiff <laughs> once, right? And my mates shouting, that should have cost you 10 grand. <laughs> <laughs> Cardiff is probably the filthiest night out I've ever had. Really? Yeah, it was mad. It was mad. And everyone goes, everyone goes 100 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah, it's good. 100 miles an hour. It's great. Yeah. And actually, yeah, I ended up in a, in a chippy in Cardiff. Yeah, yeah. you would have been in Chippy Alley. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. I sat down with, uh, this is a true story, sat down with, with my cheesy chips, they were cheesy yeah. chips, and a uh, girl came and just sat down next to me and she went, let's have one of those, and just, just grab my chips. <laughs> it's helped yourself. Them. Like, yeah. Yeah, help yourself. The worst, Sharing's caring. <laughs> the worst thing I've ever done in Chippy Alley, I think, is I had a sausage, sausage, chips and curry sauce, and I dropped the sausage on the floor as I came out and I thought, that's no, fine. no one else saw it. <laughs> no one else saw it. saw it. <laughs> it I love that. The, you know, we're like, we're, grit. At, at, yeah, you, yeah. It was. That horrible black yeah, sort yeah, yeah. of coating <laughs> that's over all of the chip shop floors, just covered in a bit of that. Yeah, great seasoning. That <laughs> bring, bring it on. While we got you, it'd be criminal mm. for us not to subject Ben to some humiliation. Yeah, and I not? was wondering whether you could perhaps take us through some operatic mm. vocal warm ups. Actually, so I'm really interested in music in general and the the timbre of a of an op- opera singer's voice is very different in you know, when compared to like pop singers mm-hmm. and stuff. So do you reckon you could just explain a little bit about yeah, that and then and then perhaps take us both through uh some a bit of vocal, yeah. So, in opera, nothing's mic'd. So you have to have what we call blade to cut through the noise, the sound. Uh, so it's like you have to place the voice in. If you look at a skull, wherever the hollows are. So in your head, around your nose, in the nose, in your cheeks, and you're like, hey, 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 hey. It's quite this driven hey, hey, hey. noise. And then, so you go from... Uh, oh, I can't really do it anymore because my voice is overtrained, I guess. But uh, like this very soft sound if you're a pop singer, to mm. uh, a very wow. direct noise yeah. that kind of cuts through. It's actually not very pleasant in a small room, but if you put it in a bigger room, then there's that. But what you got to do is you can't just build the house as it is. You've got to put foundation. So it's all about breathing, right? So Ben, if you look at my stomach, which is ever expanding, right? So <laughs> when too. I breathe, when I breathe. Nothing moves here. Nothing moves in your chest. You say to somebody, sing as an opera singer, and the first thing they do is lift their chest. <gasps> yeah. 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 So the best way person to ever look at to find a perfect breathing is a newborn baby because they scream like hell, but they don't raise their chest. They like kind of go. So <gasps> true. So that, then you, you've got to breathe deep, and open your throat. So you know th- when you went to the day off school mm. and you try and make yourself sick at the Tickle back. Tickle the yeah. yeah. So. You, it's called the epiglottis, right? And that hangs down. So you've got to try and get that out of the way. So you can If I was to say to you both, hey, you've just won the lottery. Yeah. And you can feel the cold oh. air on the back of your yeah. throat. That's your throat open. And then you just sing. So it's one motion in and one motion out. So you, if you were like, sorted food, are you there? So that's all you do. That is it. Okay. Where are we doing you, that? You do, I, I, no, no, come on. You've got to do this as well. Right, on, sit up do, straight. You do sorted and food. Are you there? Breathe deep. Sorted food. Are you there? Go. Sorted food. Are you there? Ben, you're a much better singer. Your throat's closed. You're like this. Are you there? <laughs> are you there? Getting better. I mean, you do sound like Kermit, but yeah, it is, it is <laughs> getting you better. There? Halfway up the stairs, there's a new I sit. <laughs> Is it stop? Because sit rhymes stop, with yeah. and stop not. Yeah, yeah, stop. yeah, yeah never that's mind. Right. It could have been a very different Muppets Christmas Carol, <laughs> right? <laughs> we always finish these episodes on a final question. You might have even touched upon it okay. um, already, but what would you say to someone is the one thing that they have to cook and eat before they die? Oh What's the one thing that you say you've just got? Just give this a go. Just got to give this a go. 
That is a brilliant question because there's just a thousand things. Because I always think about my death row meal. Yeah. And um, when I was 50, I actually did got some people in to cook me my death row meal. What was it? Well, and they, my friends, without me knowing, set up the house like a court. So I was actually... <laughs> and they condemned you to death. I was actually on death row. And so they all stood up and said why I should be put to death. <laughs> we, Charming. We need to go to the rugby with your bags. Oh my God, you can come anytime you <laughs> oh, want, mate. You can come anytime. So I love scallops. So we had scallops to start with some uh, like black pudding and stuff with it. Just classic. Then for me... It just, it's just a memory, right? We used to have this thing in the 70s and the 80s called a Bernie Inn, right? And basically, you could only get certain things. All you could get really was a steak. Yeah. And the steak came with mushrooms and chips, a, a, a grilled tomato, right? This was the choice of starters that you could have, right? Going back. And my father would always say before we go in, right, starters are put in. You're not having both. We haven't got enough money. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Starters was prawn cocktail. Yeah. Garlic mushrooms, right? Yeah. And an orange juice. That was the choice. <laughs> I never a glass of orange juice? I never chose the orange never. juice. <laughs> never. Who's ever. choosing the orange juice? I don't know. But that was one of them. Then you can have that steak. And that steak is... is I, that, that's, that's what it. I'd say to anybody. Steak, steak and peppercorn sauce is probably the greatest match that's ever been made with chips. Amazing. In a sous vide, so it's perfectly cooked, <laughs> perfect temperature. And I've done some really expensive steaks, and I've done some really, you know, I've tried to elevate it as mm. much as you possibly can. It's still steak and chips, yeah. Right? It's classic. It's, it's just and so it's classic delicious. for a reason. Oh yeah, I just love it. There's ev- everything about food is in a steak and chips. That I'd say that's a great steak answer. and peppercorn sauce. Steak and peppercorn sauce, and then rhubarb crumble and custard, right? Oh, but yeah. don't try and give me creme anglaise because all creme anglaise means is a small portion of custard. Right? <laughs> so don't thinner. try and give me that. I just want custard. I want proper custard. I love this. this is normal home cook meet chef. <laughs> the marriage of both. It's yeah, perfect. The, yeah, you are. Leave the celery out and don't give me creme anglaise. Like, <laughs> perfectly central. This is this is great. But he'll happily have oysters in Leon. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Too not, right. Not a problem. Too right. Well, thank you so much for thank coming you. in and, and chatting with us. It's been unbelievable. Um, and, and just just one more time. Yeah. Go compare. Go compare! Yes! <laughs> Thank you. That's another Thank three you. quid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Man, that was awesome. I oh, know you were great.